let's talk about it. Hello and welcome back to Thick Radio, the podcast where we talk about gaining, fetism and everything in its orbit. I'm James. And I'm Tim. So let's get into it. Today we're welcoming back to the show. Today we've got Henry again. Hello all. How are we doing? Oh, doing pretty good. Doing good. good my love. How are you? Good. I'm doing very well, thank you. Very, very well in the midst of exams and all that fun stuff that we get at the end of university. So I'm nearly there and yeah, I'm doing very well, thank you. Oh, look, we're glad to hear it. Now, look, as a bit of an aside before we get into the episode, because you, you're a singer by trade, is that right? I am. Yes, I am a singer by trade. You're a singer by trade. I might have to, I might have to, to get you on my, my seminal album when I finally get around to doing some kind of parody gainer bullshit and you can... Definitely. Yeah. You can give me some fabulous backup vocals. You can have a solo. Write me a little rap mm. verse. It'll be fantastic. Oh, definitely. You know. Wouldn't it be a gag if you? Uh, wouldn't it be a gag if you turn out to be like the weird Al of the gainer world? <laughs> ah, maybe, maybe. Well, as my singing teacher says, I am quotes built to sing. Oh. So whatever that means, I take it as a compliment. But apparently, I'm built to be a singer. They're built Which. to sing. Well, everyone, when you look at the socials, you will see good and goddamn well that Henry is not built like uh, Zendaya, shall we say. He's more built like Pavarotti. So, mm. you know. I want to add a, a young Pavarotti there. Let's young. Not, let's young. not age me yet. I'm not young Pavarotti. Young and gorgeous and beautiful and thin and young and gorgeous. Yeah, um, and yeah. Casper Moore. <laughs> Maybe not the thin. Not, not quite the thing. Thin, ha! Thin, <laughs> me, never. <laughs> but listen, we've brought you back today to talk a little bit about. I suppose, I suppose you could say one of those very typical gainer things, right? Like we're calling this episode "Analog versus Digital." We're talking about the in-person experience of like gaining and being with people versus the digital. And honestly, I think we can all relate to this right absolutely so we're just going to get into it today so henry my darling tell me what have your experiences been like meeting gainers and fetists in person i think they've been very mixed for me personally i think it's been all of them absolutely fantastic i've had the pleasure of meeting some incredible incredible men and they've all just really made me feel confident I think the thing for me always was this in the past and like in the when I was kind of I say younger I'm so you know well you know what I mean when I was younger in the community I was very always like oh I need to really know the person before I meet them and you know spend months talking to them but I think nowadays I am far more like yeah let's meet up and we've only talked for an hour but fuck it you're driving down the road so let's meet for me it's always been a very positive very relaxing and fun experience it's never really been too awkward or arduous i mean i'm 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 happy to hear that because i think many of us and i will age myself here and tim of course by <laughs> saying we come from a generation where perhaps meeting members of the community has been fraught with questions <laughs> and uncertainty and i feel like your experiences henry as a younger member of the community and as someone who has been around you know for a couple of years now reflecting maybe that newer generation of people who have less hang-ups people who if you don't get on it's because you don't get on because not everyone's built to get on yeah. rather than any of the myriad of hang-ups that typically follow, I suppose, elder millennials and beyond in, in, in terms of the background bits with regards to gaining. I mean, again, Tim, as our elder statesman of the group, <laughs> as, as our um, elder, no, no, of course, as the older person in the group, how does that marry up with your experiences, especially from when you first started engaging with the community? Well, I, I discovered the community online like most of us did. Um, so in the in the earliest years, like 18, I wasn't really the opportunity to meet up 
uh it was it wasn't as prevalent like because again we were separated by so much distance so if you didn't meet if you didn't end up talking to somebody like within 50 miles of you you probably didn't meet up a lot and i i i did take a big chance i got <laughs> i flew to oregon to meet up with a gainer when i was 18 um and it was a decent experience i mean it was the very first time i had ever done that so it's not that it ended up being something that I regretted in any way there were things I would have done differently um but so then from then on there was like this long stretch where I didn't meet up with people because I lived in Cleveland and Cleveland is not exactly a hot spot for gaining as the years go on uh I've kind of adopted like Henry's idea you know it's like <clears throat> I don't necessarily know you that well but we live in the same city I'm I'm offering to meet up in a public place so let's just meet up and yet still that poses a problem for some people. There are some of them that like they'll flake on you on the last minute or like a day before they'll say, oh, I can't make it. And then sometimes when you do meet up, you might not necessarily have anything to talk about outside of the fetish. So, you know, because you're just two different people. Um, I've had more success connecting with people in a, in, a, in a digital space because I've been able to tailor my social experience my way through the social apps. That makes sense. I mean, I can imagine, you know, that first time you met that person in Oregon when you were 18, things you might have done differently was not go during the time of the Donna party. I think that would have really assisted with the situation. You son of a bitch. <laughs> How the fuck do you know about the Donna party? Is that the one that told you? Yes, you are. <laughs> oh, son of a bitch. See, that's what I get for telling you stuff. <laughs> Uh, Henry and the listeners who don't know, uh, the Donna Party was a group of people who went west in America about a thousand years ago and then ended up dying because of deep winter. It was an age. Good to know. Good to know. I want to do. You know, it's 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 my yeah. it's my role as the young, beautiful ingenue of the podcast. And incidentally, the Donner Party was headed for California, not Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> It's in the same direction, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's that way. We all know the direction they were going in. Yeah, when we and that's all this that is all this that way. When you're top down on the continent, it's all to the left, right? Yeah. Oh, it, it is. Isn't Everything it? goes yes, that way. It's to the left. It's to the left. Okay, so I was more or less it's headed okay. for the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, heading heading for the left hand side of the bitch. Okay, good, good. At least we've got that correct. But back to the point. I want to ask you, Henry. You've spoken obviously about those in-person experiences, which is great. How does that differ to the relationships you've developed more specifically in an online context? Oh, I think it's so different. I think there's this thing, this big issue that, well, not big issue, I guess it's this big kind of um, difference that you get online where because it's online and I'm choosing when to respond, I can exactly tailor how I want to come across. And I think that's the same on all platforms, regardless of what they are, what they do. Um, you know, I can choose how I'm coming across, how people are perceiving me, whether that be in a more sexual light, in a more dominant light, in a more submissive light. I can choose how that goes. And I think that allows me then to feel more comfortable in sharing, where when it's in person, obviously, it's harder to hide certain things about myself it's harder to come across in the way that maybe I'd particularly like to so I often sometimes I have had men whom I meet with say I'm a very different person in person than I'm online it's like well of course I am because on online what you're seeing is what I want to put out in person what you're seeing is a full human being not just a picture of a stomach online mm, and, and i suppose that brings back probably the really interesting point there is like how do those relationships shift when they've begun online and then they progress to something in person like what do you find kind of shifts the most in that progression of a relationship for me it's the, how sexual everything is i think so often and I'm going to say, like, it's close to, like, 95% of the time. The conversations I'm having online are sex or sexual-based. Um, not necessarily gay. Sometimes, you know, um, I'm very open that I'm into multiple different things. So often they're very sexual-based. And as time goes on, if that I feel like there could be a connection with the person, 
often and that kind of veers more towards life and general life experiences whether that be um, what you're doing currently where you've come from as a human being but I think it's that thing of it's a progression that I think people I have with people it's that it start normally starts quite sexual and progresses into something that is more human based and me personally based hmm I mean Tim you've touched on this before like it's a generational thing like back in yeah. your kind of like your earlier days it was more people fucked first and then introduced and then got to know each other yeah like <laughs> unfortunately I I sometimes wonder if uh, millennials my age will kind of be known for um fucking on the first date and then finding out what their name is like <laughs> But I do want to circle back because you'd mentioned before about that sense of sexuality that really emerges with a primarily online friendship. How do you have that conversation around consent and respecting boundaries with friends online versus in person? I think the thing online is because I'm, well, my issue is online, I often struggle with men not understanding my boundaries because I am so sexually open. They just assume that, of course, I'm going to be online 24-7, ready to talk, ready to meet up. And I've had some people get quite annoyed at me for not being there constantly, constantly wanting a long conversation about going into deep detail. And for me, it's like I've had to really set those boundaries and also not be afraid to press the block button. I think... When I was younger, I think I was very much like, no, I, I don't want to, I'm too, I'm too nice, I'm, I don't want to do that. But now I'm like, you piss me off, you're gone, you know. And this then this counter in person, because I'm not typing it on a phone and planning it in my head and drafting it, it me, for me, it's this thing of often, it's this classic, my, when me and my friends get drunk, we are classic white women and we sit around our table and we gossip, and we share far too much. I know more about my friend than I ever wanted to know, but I know everything about her. In my first year at uni, we sat at that dining table, and we showed each other our news, and said, should I send this to someone? Like, we, we overshared, but that's because we were in person, and we were, it was this mutual consent of, we are all on the same plane here, and if someone was uncomfortable, immediately everyone understood to step back. And I would say it is a maturity thing. You know, I have a friend who is, I'm going to say much older, because he might get pissed off. He's older than me, who is far less mature than me. You know, we had a party a few months back um, where a friend's father sadly just got cancer and he got absolutely shit-faced and was running around this, my garden screaming at the top of the lungs. My friend sat in the corner sobbing her eyes out. It's this maturity thing that people need to understand about in-person consent and knowing when it's the appropriate time to say certain things. Exactly the same as online, when to say certain things and how to approach someone. I always say that it's important you... The, what you say in, in a direct message is what you should say to a person to their face. You know, would you walk up to someone in the street and flash them? If you wouldn't, stop sending unsolicited um, nudes. <laughs> you know, it's it's just the thing of like, don't do it. It's I don't want to wake up at 6am and stare at your penis. Like, no, that's not what I wanted in the morning. If the night before I'd said I'd love to see it and I wake up to it of course I'm going to want to see it but a random dude from Russia just sending me a nude no thank you I don't want that no, I totally identify with the um you know people that expect you to be at their beck and call as soon as they start messaging you and it's like I am a person who has a full-time life I've got a full-time job I've got a relationship I've got a household I've got a dog I've got a lot of stuff that I have to do during a day and sometimes I'm just exhausted I'm just yeah. tired. I've got ennui. I don't necessarily want to have to mm. carry on an extremely long conversation. And um, <clears throat> like with me, I'm always, uh, I, I always try to be upfront with people online. Like, 
like I um when it comes to like what kind of things they're willing to talk about or what they want to exchange and like I'm usually upfront about the whole like I'm not going to send you nudes like if you want to see them go to my OnlyFans or go to my Twitter that's where I post them don't expect me to send you stuff that I wouldn't post anywhere else because that's how you get in trouble you start sending people things you wouldn't normally post online and before you know it it's going to wind up somewhere else yeah. Um, in person, uh, usually if I'm going to meet up with somebody, I will let them know like what I'm willing to do in a, in a meetup. And sometimes they're nice enough to ask, which I think is great when they say, well, what are you comfortable with doing when we meet up? And I'll just list it out. I'm like, this is what I'm willing to do. This is what I'm not willing to do. Yeah. Pro tip for new gamers in your notes up on your phone, write a list of all the things that you're willing to do. Cause then it's easy when you get asked. That's what I learned. A few months ago, I've just like I've got it in my notes app. So whenever I ask, I'm just like mm, copy paste. There you go. Because it's you, I get asked it all the time. It's that's, a thing that we all get asked. That's brilliant, honestly. And you know that that also kind of touches base on the thing of like profiles, right? Like we always say, put it in the profile. Like you declare what you want. The right people will come to you. But the amount of people who just they aren't don't bother to read them. <laughs> they aren't looking. They see you. They've got. A, they see you've got a pulse, and they're like, oh, that'll. That'll do, won't it? <laughs> and that's kind of it. So having things on hand that help to help mm. you to, to walk your way through a situation, very yeah. good. Very, very good advice there. Now, I do want to ask, what have your experiences been like with Gainer events? Have you been to many yet or not really? No, I've actually been to none. Been to um, none. Okay. You've got to, for me, it's always a thing of, I, is this going to appeal to me? Or personally, I am trying to save up to buy a house. So I can't afford to go on a cruise for 10 days. And, yeah. you know, all these big things that um, Gromoff organised, I can't afford to do. But um, it's what I think I'd love to do in the future, I think, is go to some events and kind of experience that feeling. Um, I'm very lucky that I have a friendship group who we are kind of sexually open with each other. So I, I don't feel suppressed in any way that I don't get to talk sexually and openly to people. But I think it would be nice to kind of sit down and have a conversation to, with people about these things. Now, the reason I wanted to ask about events is because I am curious to ask, based on the way that you see them being talked about, promoted, uh, the way in which people share their experiences online from these instances, do you get the sense that these events kind of clearly make out what their purpose are, what the boundaries of the events are going to be, or do you feel that you see these things and maybe get a sense of uncertainty from them? I think for me, I always see them as this thing of they're aimed to be quite sexual. And I think I'm always kind of worried to go to them because not to brag, but I do have a decent following on Twitter and YouTube and things like that, that I do sometimes get a bit concerned that like, oh, what if I show up and people know me and recognize me? Um, I had it just the other day, someone recognized me in the street and I was like, they came up to me and was like, oh, I, I know you from somewhere. And I looked at them and I said, hmm, yes, you do. But it was that thing you can't, I just didn't say, because obviously we were in the middle of, um, boring in the boring in Birmingham and you can't, you can't just sit there and be like oh yes I'm a gainer and you were uh, sent me a dick pic a few months ago yes I yes I know who you are you know so for me they're always they're marketed in a way that's kind of this thing that they're aimed for people who to express their sexuality in a comfort in a comforting place and in a space that isn't maybe um in person so maybe if they have only done it in their bedrooms and online that they get to kind of experience it in public place where it's a safe and you're not meeting at a stranger's house you're meeting in a cafe or a bar or mm -hmm. something like that it's interesting that you said that they feel marketed as if they are sexual i guess i've just been naive because like i've been a part of other fetish communities for a long time like the leather community for instance mm -hmm. And like, so I've been, I've become very accustomed to going to spaces where kink is out on display, but only to a certain extent, like, because these things are held in public places. They're held in like hotels where the hotels have been sold out or other convention spaces that have been rented. So yes, like 
the everyone in there is a part of your group but you're also still in public so like there's we all know that like public nudity is not you know legal in a lot of states so we've all like we all are accustomed to seeing people scantily clad in leather but we know we're not going to see any cock mm -hmm. out we're not going to see you know someone's asshole exposed or anything like that and when it comes to the gaining uh events it's like again we're in a public space so like when we were on the ship you know it's i suppose it was sexual in the way that we were mostly exposed but like we weren't walking around nude so like i don't i guess i didn't I think, see it as something yeah. sexual when i have talked to people they often have described them as like uh oh yeah like i'll i'll come with you because like oh i don't want you to get like touched up or like you know it's like that and i'm like why would that happen and i don't know maybe it's just a uk thing or a birmingham thing but like, yeah, they they often, for me, I feel like they would be something that is sexual, you know. I mean, to be fair, we we did a we did a lot of groping. We did a lot of groping and belly playing out in public. Okay. But we we did it. Cons I mean, it was with it was consent. You yeah. know, like everyone that we did that with, they were perfectly okay with us doing it. Like we yeah. didn't push it on anyone who was a bit more reserved. I think, and like again, I think it's this level of maturity that people need to understand and I, I i i find it interesting this whole um passing of consent because it's kind of going back to what we talked about beginning in my field of work we often have talked about consent um i've seen people literally fired from their job because they haven't followed consent rules and they have touched up um females and men in very inappropriate ways that should never be allowed um but again i think it's because there's also this power play because we are like, all sex is a power move there's someone who is the dominant and there's someone who's a submissive whether that be even if it's vanilla you can't help it but the top will always be more dominant than a bottom who will always be slightly more submissive well, yeah, and I, I see, I see the face. I, see <laughs> I was about to say, I know, I know some very aggressive bottoms. <laughs> but you can be aggressive, but there's a difference between. It's this thing of, a bottom will always be. How do I put it? How do I, how, I need to do my words? Well, I mean, the bottom is the one that's obviously getting penetrated, but yeah, you know. So I suppose just on that level, you would assume that the bottom would be the submissive position. But like I said, I know some very aggressive power bottoms. So <laughs> I think a lot of this as well comes back to like the newness of a lot of these conversations, right? Like the idea of sex has existed yeah. since life itself began. But like as humans who are having conversations about do you want it, who has power, yada, 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 that is so new yeah. to the cultural zeitgeist. And we're still ironing it out in many ways trying to get everyone on board yeah. up to speed and i think oh. honestly the term feedism is a great example of that shift because on the straight side of things it used to be considered feederism but now the term is feedism and a big part of that shift was to reposition the power with the feed rather than the feeder because in that hetero cis head uh concept of sex you could term the feeder is the penetrator the feed yeah penetrated and much in the same way as a lot of conversations in bdsm typically speaking it is the person who has to receive that is being positioned as the person who must have the final say or the person who must ultimately give the 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 the, the big moment of consent because they are the person who if things go wrong they would be on the receiving end of the thing that goes wrong so it yeah sense that as a world culture this is the way that the power dynamic is kind of being refocused as the responsibility of course with the person who does the dominating the penetrating the feeding must respect the person who is being dominated fed penetrated yeah. and i just think it's such a good conversation for us all to have because i think mm -hmm. that there would be many gainers listening even right now who the concept of like where the line of consent can be in certain situations within gaining might appear very confusing because no one fucking talks about consent 
right? Like yeah. it is just implicit, implied, much like what we were talking about with the crews. And mind you, again, that's in person. There are many people around. There's understandings of things. But when it's one-on-one and when it's that minutia, I think it is good to be able to have these conversations mm-hmm. to help people to kind of think through the logic and the reasoning and to become more comfortable with conversations on consent. Oh, completely. I think there's this big important thing at the moment of consent is, I think in previous years, people saw consent as purely the penetrated, as you said, is the only one that can give consent in these situations. And they are the person that can give the consent. But I think this is a really important thing at the moment about, no, this is about two mutuals coming together. And it's like this thing of, I recently had a feeding where I was very, in, I'm in my, as my friend is saying, my liquid phase. I'm really enjoying like shakes and cream and all of that. And he was like, no, really not into that. Really not into liquids and all of that. And I then was then like, okay, yeah, that's fine. We'll just use solid foods. And it's that thing of, I can't, I couldn't force him to do it. But also it's the same thing of, he, I then had to consent to him tying me to my bed and feeding me. And I think it's this thing of people need to understand this. It's a mutual consent. It's two people both needing to consent, not one and not the other. It's two people both needing to consent. 100%. And I think that was a good deviation, honestly, because this whole conversation is about online versus in-person discourse. And it is a big thing, I think, in our community that we struggle with. Many people have expressed the first time they go to an event, they don't know what to do with themselves because people like yourself, Henry, get a sense that it's about sex. They prep themselves for sex. Turns out there's no sex to be had and they're going... What am I meant to do here? This hasn't been made clear to me. Some people are obviously looking for a more social setting and then they're confronted with sex and it can be very cutting of heads. And that's no one's fault really, because as a community, we're just not talking about it enough. Yeah. But this is just one of those conversations that happen and it has to happen again and again and again. And even though we're going to have it on the podcast again and again, listeners, you need to have it again and again with Mm -hmm. all of your friends, with all of your mutuals and get this ball rolling because it's not going to get any easier until we all kind of just get on board with like being better with consent, basically. You know, the reason I think a lot of this happens is because I I don't know if I've ever said this on the pod before, but I think I've talked to you about it, James, is, you know, like things are changing for queer people, especially the younger generations, like they're able to be out sooner. And some of them are able to go through this sort of heteronormative dating rituals that a lot of teenagers get to go through. But those of us who are older, we didn't really get that opportunity. You know, like we, a lot of us knew in like primary school that we were different you know, we hit puberty, we discover, oh shit, you know, I'm gay. So that's what this means. Yada, yada. You get to high school. And if you're the only gay kid who's out in the high school, you're not really being, uh, you don't have the option to date anybody. You don't get to go to the prom or other dances with the boys that you want to be with. So we kind of don't have the ability to socialize with each other. We're not taught those very simple rituals of interaction. So like mm-hmm. when we do all get together, and I think this is the reason why millennials my age just started having sex right away is because we didn't know anything else. Like we we discovered the internet, we found porn, we thought this is what it means to be gay. So obviously that's what we have to do. We have to just start fucking everything in sight. You know, like we're, I, I'm, I'm very curious to see when the younger Gen Z kids and when the alpha generation finally, you know, comes along and is of age, what they're going to put emphasis on you know, and how well they'll interact with each other. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like the conversation around cancer. For a long time, people just didn't know that it existed because humans just died too soon before cancer would really metastasize for the majority of people. And it's only thanks to the advent of a lot of modern medicine and the overcoming of a lot of the typical illnesses that we've now reached the new major barrier, which is cancer. And it's like, oh, Well, I guess that was always there. We were just dying of other things too soon to notice it was there. Same thing with consent as a big push on what is necessary and craved and wanted in a lot of these interactions. Once we get a hold on that, there's probably going to be a litany of like new things we're going to want to overcome and conquer. But those will come in time, you know, step at a time. And 
cultural and historical context are also really, really important because we can't judge older generations for how they did things if it breaches consent because that was just how things were done. It wasn't understood to be that way. It was treated differently or it wasn't given priority. And therefore, we can't feel bad about that. We can choose to go, isn't it wonderful that we have progressed from where we were then to where we are now? And we will continue to progress. But I suppose that's the only difference is when we contrast the two, we look at people as if people exist in time periods locked away. Oh, the older generation back however many years ago, they're all dead. We don't need to worry about that. But they're not. They're actually still here with us. They're just older and they're having to adapt and move into things. So, again. I mean, yeah, look at Tim. He's still here. He's <laughs> I think he's dead yet. I think this is fantastic. You know, I remember when yeah. Tim and I first met when they hacked him out of the iceberg. It was quite incredible. I didn't know that Crow Magnum could. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm not fucking Encino, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, but I do think it brings up something very interesting this idea of like people who are online and I think the term that people are going along with now is people who are chronically online as in people who live primarily on the internet and don't really do a lot of stuff outside do you feel like that's something that maybe the community struggles with a little bit possibly I think it's this thing well actually I think it's yeah, it's almost the antithesis. Well, I can't remember what word is. The the main thing of this that I think so many people think some of these people only exist online. They're not real humans. Like, like we go back to this thing of being annoyed when you're not there to have a conversation. It's this thing of I think people just assume that it's it's only online and it's only a thing that can happen online. But like for me, it's this thing of. I'm not only a person, I'm also a, a somewhat sexual content creator. I create content for people. But that doesn't mean that I'm always there. You know, I very much enjoy my life outside of gaining and outside of sex. And I think it's this thing that some people do think that that's what it's like, that you're always there, you're always online. All I'm doing is sat, sitting in my bedroom, stuffing my face and posting about it online. It's like, no, I have a life. I go on walks, I eat and drink metabolism juice. You know, it tastes fucking delicious, so I'm going to drink it, you know? It's this thing that people just expect you to be online because that's the only way that they've seen you. They've only ever seen you through their phone or on their laptop. You know, that's the only place that they've ever seen you. Mm. I can't say as I necessarily blame them, though, because, like, <clears throat> so much of the gainer community is held online because, like you said, like, events that happen are sometimes very expensive and require a lot of travel. Um, local grom offs are not always happening in your area. You may not have a ton of gainers that live in your vicinity. And even if you do, they might not be very comfortable or willing to meet up. So when you feel isolated and, like, you're the only the only way that you can consume any of this is online. I'm not surprised that a lot of them feel that way about it, that it is solely online. And that, like, you know, if they're if they're very deeply rooted into the fetish and they're like, well, I'm on my phone and I'm going on Grommer every, you know, couple of seconds and I'm looking through my Twitter feed and I'm going on Instagram, like, why aren't you doing that? You know, <clears throat> I'm curious to ask Tim in your experience, uh, having been a part of more communities and for longer, like, do you find that that kind of chronically online factor of gaining and feedism, does that parrot and mirror in other fetish communities? Or does their established history of being like in person with bars and events and movements and things like that, does that kind of shift things a little bit to how the gainer community does things. It does, it does, because like, take leather, for example, leather is a much more easily uh, explainable fetish, you know, like leather is not something that people tend to look at with negativity. You know, like you say you're into leather, that could mean anything from, I like to be tied up and beat with a leather riding crop to I like to wear Harley Davidson apparel. You know, that's such a broad concept. Like, 
So it's a much more palatable thing to say to people. And leather spaces are not usually looked down upon either. It's like this, it's like most gay men know if you're going to go to the local leather bar, you're going to the kinky bar, you're going to see people dressed up in leather, you're going to see maybe someone's tied up to a St. Andrew's cross and getting whipped, but you know, that's not that's not a mainstay. Um, whereas with you know gainer uh based events. I feel like people feel like if there's a bit, if there's a ton of like fat men in one space there, I think people are afraid that someone's going to say something must be up with that. That's kind of weird. Why are there all these fat people around something going on here? Like they don't necessarily think that if they see a bunch of people clad in leather, they think, Oh, it must be a biker convention or something. Which is really interesting when you think about the fact that the majority of people are fat now and like, I don't know, fat people can be friends with anyone if you saw like a group of fat people together, like we encountered this on the cruise, people were like, oh my God, are you a rugby team? Like, yeah, yeah see, like they made an assumption right away because they saw all these large men and they thought, well, why would all of these large people be together unless it was something like a high school reunion or a rugby team or something yeah. else, you know? I don't know. Like it's, it comes back to points I've thought is really interesting in the past. Like we have this weird thought in our head that, you know, everybody on the planet earth is about three seconds away from figuring out that we're all gainers. And the moment they figure it out, we're all going to be shunned from society. You know, it's just not that, pace. I would quickly add to that. It's not the end of the world. If people do figure it out just yeah. for my, yeah. for all the no, listeners out there uh, yeah. who are young, it's like, it's not the end of the world. I had a friend figure it out once and he was, he was okay. He had some questions, but like, you know, as long as you're open, I think it's fine. Sorry. Back to the main point. Just needed to mention that. No, no, I, that's honestly so important. And again, we say this on the podcast all the time. Like you will be surprised, not that you have to come out, but I want to just ask the pair of you here for people who, and I think we can ascertain this, right? That the majority of people in the community are more comfortable online than they are in person, right? What advice would you both have to listeners who want to start meeting up with people in person and just need to take the plunge? Like what advice do you have for them? Exactly that, take the plunge. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you're never going to get anywhere if you don't take a step forward. So, uh, and I understand that it's intimidating. I get it. I was intimidated when I went to a grandma for the first time. I was intimidated meeting up with someone from Grammar for the first time. Um, but like we like we've said earlier in the episode, like know your what you want to do, what you don't want to do, be upfront about it. And if you're afraid of being rejected for what you won't do, then you shouldn't be meeting up with that person in the first place. Like if if, if you if they give you grief for that, you know, like, oh well, you know, I thought that I was gonna be able to like stuff you until you couldn't move and then, you know, fuck every hole you have. Like <laughs> If that's not what you want to do, then don't meet up with that person, you know. Um, but you got to take some kind of initiative because it's not just going to fall in your lap, you know. It's yeah. not going to be the guy. To, you're not. You're not going to be like searching on Grammar one night and you discover that there's someone living down the street from you that's into this. That's not going to happen. So you have to take some initiative. You have to take a, a chance. Um, I would say just as, as a precaution, don't agree to go to anybody's house, you know, agree to meet in a public well lit during the day kind of space, you know, and if it goes well, and you, you have a, a good conversation with the person you suss out, okay, I don't think this person is a serial killer, then, you know, on your second meeting, you could agree to meet in a private home. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just take, take the chance because you never know what could happen. Yeah. I think I'd add just you to you. Like I think it's this thing of people get so caught up in this need to be something they're not, and it's like you be you, babes. And I think people also be, would be surprised. I, you know, personally, I know that like I'd love to just meet up for a coffee and have a chat. And I think people get so caught up in like, oh, I've got to meet up and have sex, be sexual, and feed them to the point where they're bursting and they can't move and they get so obsessed with this 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 fiction and what they assume is should be happening but really I think people just need to be more open and honest with what they want and not be afraid to say I just love to be up for coffee do you know what I want to close on this when Tim and I 
were going on the cruise together. I was so excited. As much as I wanted to go on my first game of cruise, I was going to have fun. The thing I was looking forward to most, meeting my best friend in real life for the first time. And I remember saying to Tim, I'm terrified of meeting you. And Tim was like, why? And I said, quite honestly, what if we meet and you don't like me? And it just turns out all of this was some kind of online fantasy that we'd built up this friendship, this parasocial thing, and it all comes crumbling down. Even that, a year of getting to know each other, doing a fucking podcast together, I was racked with fear and anxiety. But I'll tell you this now. I turned around in the hotel lobby. I saw this bitch. We walked right over to each other and we hugged for at least what, like two minutes straight. We just held each other and didn't fucking let go. And it wasn't creepy. It was wonderful because in that moment, I realized that I had nothing to worry about because Tim had been authentic with me and I'd been authentic with him. And all this was, was the coming together of two individual people celebrating an incredible friendship. But listen, we've reached the end of our episode today. Henry, thank you so much for coming back to join us, babe. Oh, you're so welcome, loves. It's been such a privilege and an honor to get to come back. And I hope I come back again next season and talk about more fat things. (laughs) Oh God, well, you know, we want to have you darling every day Hey, God damn it. Now, Thank listen, you, darling. where can the listeners find you online? So you can find me on YouTube at Piglet1997, on Grommer, Piglet1997, and Twitter, Oz Piglet19. Yes, Piglet1997. Please give me a follow and see all my gorgeous roles and everything that I'm doing on there. It's very exciting. Oh, Love it. But that's a wrap for now here on Thick Radio. Please remember to like and subscribe, rate us five stars, and leave us a good review. If you liked this episode, the podcast, or just us in general, share it with your friends and encourage them to tune in. You can find me on Instagram and Beefy Frat at Stanham. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, and Beefy Frat at Thicky Mouse. You can also look us up on TikTok at Thick Radio or at our website at www.podpage.com forward slash Thick Radio. If you want to submit a voice note, you can reach us at anchor.fm forward slash Thick Radio forward slash message. And if you have any questions or ideas for episodes, you can reach us at thethickradio at gmail.com. So until next time, bye fats. Bye, fats. Bye, fats. Let's talk about it. Dick Radio is a Patreon and Anchor app podcast produced by Stan and Dickie Nuss. Next and Master by Stan. Our artwork is provided by Logitech. Our theme song is provided by Spotify Training.